Okay, hello there. Can you guys hear me? Hey, Dr. Morris, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now. Perfect. Dr. Morris, is it possible for you to turn uh, up the, the volume of your mic, maybe a smidge? Let me see here. Okay. Uh, does that help? Yeah, I think that's much better. Okay. I'll augment it on my end. I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing here. Can you see me? Yes, Dr. Morris, we can see you. Yep. Uh, figure out what I'm doing here. Uh, how much longer do you want to wait before we start? Uh, just a couple more minutes. Okay. Yeah, while we're waiting here, I'm playing with all these buttons here, trying to figure out what they do here on this side. Trying to figure out if there's some way just to shrink all the, uh, after I put my video on, there's like a whole huge column on the right here. So right up. I think if you, there should be a couple of buttons on top of the, where everybody's video, uh, video screens are. It should say, show thumbnail video, show grid video, and there should be one that says um, like either hide thumbnail video or something next to it, so. Hmm. On our end though, Dr. Morris, we're, we're, we, we only have your uh, video in the top corner, so we, we have a full view of your slides, so we're good. Okay, that's what I was kind of worried about there, because my, my little drop down things kind of sit right in the middle of my thing here, I have to slide it over. <clears throat> Okay, well, I will enlarge it, see if it enlarges. There we go. <clears throat> now, will these guys, uh, is there any way they can actually ask questions where they're at also by unmuting their, uh, their volume at the, uh, their uh, mic at their end? Yes, um, everybody should be able to unmute themselves and ask a question or they could put it in the chat. Either one okay. would work. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Either way is fine there too. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end for some questions too, if they, uh, if they have them. <clears throat> <clears throat> Dr. 
Dr. Morris, I think we should go ahead and start since um, you likely have a lot of subject matter to cover. So um, sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Everyone again. Uh, today's going to be kind of part two where we left off last time, and we're going to talk about volumes and diffusion, uh, concentrating on guidelines and performance. Uh, by the way, feel free if you need to chirp in and ask a question any uh, along the way here. Uh, that's fine too. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest pertaining to this lecture. Uh, the ways we measure body, uh, we're going to start with talking about uh, volumes. And essentially, we uh, have two methods that we use. We can use body plethysmography and nitrogen washout. And to give a little bit of history here, actually, the, uh, the way to measure gas volumes was, that, believe it or not, first invented back in 1800 by a scientist named Davy. And it first came into clinical use uh, by uh, Dr. Darling in 1940. Uh, but, you know, we understood the limitations then that it really does not measure trapped gas and it's for, uh, uh, it's in, but we still use it uh, commonly in those who really are, cannot or unable to perform plethysmography. You know, it's a pretty simple technique, really, over here, this little diagram here, you just, patient, you know, has nitrogen in their lungs, and what you do is you just give them 100% oxygen, and then they keep breathing in and out, in and out till the lungs are empty of, of nitrogen, and you've collected all the nitrogen, and then you measure the concentration. And just simply, you can back, back calculate what the volume of the lungs were. Uh, plethysmography, we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail. Uh, that first was invented in 1956 is when that began being used. Uh, uh, it's a way of measuring the trap gas, but it is more difficult to perform that we're going to go through. Uh, the nice thing about pleth is you can also measure airway resistance, conductance, and specific conductance uh, during the same measurements. Now, when we measure lung volume, you got to remember, we're only measuring one value, and that's the FRC, okay? And then we calculate three other values from that. Uh, and uh, no matter which method we're using, whether it's pleth, nitrogen, or helium, we're still just measuring the FRC. And then we use that FRC to calculate the total by using spirometry measurements on top of that to calculate the TLC to look for hyperinflation or restriction. Uh, to uh, calculate the RV to look for hyperinflation and the RV TLC ratio to uh, look for air trapping. Now, currently, there's really only Caucasian predicted equations that are available with confidence intervals. Up till now, till the last year, the two most common authors that were used in the United States are Crapo and Quanjar. Now, uh, Beck Lake was pretty popular also, but these are the two biggies. We used Crapo in the lab downtown. He basically got his data from 200 Mormons in Salt Lake City back in 1971. Uh, Quanjar uh, uh, published his data in European Respiratory Society uh, in England in 1993. And it was kind of interesting, though, that he included his study was of minors in England. And he also included um, uh, smokers in his calculations. Now, uh, What's kind of interesting also that neither author's predicted values are dependent on age. In other words, no matter what you age, your age is, your, you know, if your size and height, your TLC is going to be the same. Uh, and the predicted values, not just predicted values don't change with age, but also the confidence intervals do not change. Now, just to give you an idea of the difference between these two, you know, why do we use one versus the other? Well, really, it doesn't make a lot of difference because uh, this is for male TLC, this is for female. And this kind of shows where, where both authors predicted values, they, they pretty much follow each other. They're pretty close to each other uh, for males and females, uh, and actually superimposed on females. Uh, with Crapo, the confidence intervals are just maybe slightly larger. With females, they're maybe just slightly larger. So it kind of balances out. But you, know, you can see how closely they correlate to each other. Now, then the question is, well, why was age not a major factor in the regression equations? Uh, for these previous authors, it really hasn't been important to consider age for years. And, you know, the principle is, we'll just take an example here, patient here, where this is a patient's TLC, uh, 66 inch tall female, it's going to be around 5.4 liters. And from the age of 20, up to about the age of 100, theoretically, that TLC is not going to change. Well, the reason behind that is because as you age, the lung, the lung loses elasticity. So we know from predicted values also that we told you about last week, the FRC decreases with age. And at the same time, because of that loss of elasticity, the RV is increasing. And these effects tend to cancel each other out. So uh, all things being equal, patients not developing, you know, vertebral collapse or osteoporosis or whatever, that TLC stays relatively constant 
uh, throughout uh, throughout their uh, their lifetime. And then along comes GLI. Uh, GLI, we talked about the spirometry GLI they did in 2012. Well, the European Respiratory Society published in 2021 another global initiative using for lung volumes. You know, it followed the same principle. They went out and collected a whole bunch of data from a lot of different centers. People are willing to give up their data. And, uh, but the problem was they only had enough data to report for European ancestry. In other words, you know, white people are Caucasians. Uh, and they actually made no mention of any kind of adjustments for age or for, I'm sorry, for, for race. They collected their data from 17 centers, 12 countries and ages five to 80. They accepted 7,190 tests out of uh, seven, about 7,700 tests. And interestingly though, 52% of these tests came from one center. Now the data wasn't off with plethysmography. You know, the, a lot of the data submitted was from nitrogen volumes, from helium volumes, as well as plethysmography. They said there were significant differences between the nitrogen and helium volumes, volumes versus plethysmography. They actually used the word significant but they still included uh, almost 1,200 patients' volumes by nitrogen and helium. So that was about 16% of their, their uh, uh, regression or their, their data they included. And then after they said there were significant differences, then later they made the comment, these significant differences did not affect the results. Now, that's a little confusing to me. I'm not sure I kind of buy that, but you know, we kind of like, remember this is not a guideline, by the way, this is just an article that was published of another set of regression equations. Now, the thing's kind of interesting, don't, don't you know, make an attempt to really look, look at this slide in any detail. The point I wanted to make here is they did give us predicted equations for a lot of different values related to volumes. But what I wanted to call your attention to is that unlike the previous authors of Crapo and others, is that GLI age does have an effect. It's a small effect. Notice it's kind of a decimal point here. And then again, they threw in the spline factor. And then they included the age, again, small effect with age. Look how that decimal, how tiny, 0. 0.00083. So age does affect that a little bit. And then there's a spline here and the confidence interval too. Now, remember what the spline is. That's the thing I had a problem with last week. The spline is, they recreate a, a regression equation, but then they have to explain, you know, there's really no equation that's gonna explain a shape like this. Like for example, the FRC goes down, it kind of bows up and comes down. Uh, males a little more straighter, straighter of a line here. Okay, what they did is they created an equation and then you have to go to an Excel database table sheet at that point. And once you do that, then you have to look at that patient's age and find out how much you have to add or subtract from that regression equation line to kind of get to, kind of get it to fit this curve. Uh, as I mentioned last week, I'll repeat myself here. I'm not a statistician, but something just seems kind of weird about that when you have to go to that extreme to do that. Uh, that there's that much variation between you know aging instead of following more of a linear pattern. Now the question is, well, how do these GLI predict this? Like I said, we're not using them right now. It's up to you guys if you ever want to adopt that. But you know, I think if you do, you need to understand what what you're doing here. Also, uh, the uh, how do they fit? Is the question. How does GLI fit with what we're currently doing with Crapo? Okay, well, uh, we're going to skip the FRC so we don't interpret that one. But we'll start with the TLC over here. Okay, the GLI equation is the black line. Well, notice how Queen Jar and, and the uh, Crapo data here, Crapo is that little purple line that's kind of almost right on top of it. And uh, uh, the Europeans use their little line is kind of right over here. So they're almost superimposed. So really be between TLC and notice also GLI stops at the same age every other author does at the age of 80. Anything above there, you have to extrapolate on that one. So, you know, TLC, it fits pretty closely. The only place it really differs down here is for the residual volume and the RVTLC ratio. Crapo is a little bit higher uh, for the RV than GLI and also for the RVTLC over here. Coin jar up here is a little even higher yet. So Crapo follows a little bit closer what we're using to GLI uh, on that. Now, the problem when you're not Caucasian Okay, we know that blacks and Asian predictions are lower than whites. The guidelines up until all the way up till 2005, uh, by the way, that lung, we do not have lung uh, volume guidelines since 2005. There is a committee currently working on them right now to develop them and release them. Uh, unlike the diffusion was released in, in uh, 
uh, a couple of years ago, along with uh, more recently spirometry. The guidelines state then, just like they have for spirometry, we do not use percept predicted of normal to determine if abnormal. Now, because GLI did not address what to do with races outside of the fact that it said you have to you have to consider that was kind of their phrase, which is kind of a cop out if you ask me. Uh, the guidelines recommended that uh, you should adjust predicted values by a percentage for blacks and Asians, and their recommendation at that time was decrease the TLC by twelve percent decrease the RV predicted value by 7% and the RV TLC increased that by 1.05. Okay, but the problem is if you change to predicted, how does that affect the confidence interval? Okay, the, the guidelines say do not use percent predicted to interpret, but then you know scale down your predicted values by this much, and then they completely ignored what effect this has on a 95% confidence interval. Okay, so guidelines, they tell us what to do, but not really what not, you know, they tell us what not to do, but not what to do. So what do we do? Well, at that time, what I did is I kind of got on, on uh, the phone there. We had a conference call with a number of people that we were on the, uh, the, uh, the network for pulmonary function testing physiology for the College of Chest Physicians, and because every one of us caught this glaring omission. And we had a discussion, well, what are we going to do? Uh, how are we going to do this if we're going to adopt the guidelines? And basically what we decided to do, you know, we're going to scale the Caucasian predicted downward, the same for Blacks, Asian, Pacific Islanders, with no scaling for Hispanics or Middle Easterners. And we're also going to change the confidence interval by about the same percentage. Makes no sense. I agree with you. But, you know, basically what it boils down to is trying to do the best we can uh, with lack of evidence. Why that's probably not correct is we know when we're looking at the uh, confidence intervals for Blacks, for spirometry and diffusion, we know their predicted values are lower, <clears throat> but their confidence intervals are, are, are greater in the studies that have been done. Uh, part of the reason for that might be because uh, unlike whites or Caucasians who are pretty much a pretty form, uniform ancestry or background, uh, the black population, it's, it's quite the converse. You're talking about many, many different races that just happen to have dark skin. And that's why when you look at predicted values, I mentioned last week, like for spirometry in countries like Africa, predicted values were taken from one part of Africa to another uh, because their demographics are so different, or their anthropomorphic features between them, their predicted are all over the map. They're not even close to each other. Uh, and from that standpoint, I guess a good example is that, you know, the, the, the population can range all the way from the pygmies to the Watusis, like from like three and a half feet tall up to, up to seven. So that's probably why their confidence intervals are, are significantly larger for all values than they are for the more uniform white population. Okay, well, then the question is, well, who made the, cold, the TLC the gold standard for restriction? And I think the answer to that is nobody on that, but a lot of people seem to, 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 to interpret it that way. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that in, in a few minutes here. But the qu question is, then, what are potential errors in obtaining the TLC? You need to understand where, we, where this comes from, Okay. Well, first of all, we measure the FRC. We've already told you that in the very first slide we started out with. We measure the first the force vital capacity in the body box or with the nitrogen method through panting maneuvers or whatever. And then we have the patient exhale from uh, two RV, and we measure the patient's expiratory reserve volume right here. Okay, then what we do is we subtract that expiratory reserve volume from the FRC to get the RV. And then at that point, we measure a slow vital capacity. It can be done either as an inspiratory maneuver or an expiratory maneuver. Uh, uh, and then what we do is we add that SVC to the RV to get the TLC. So there are a lot of steps in there. Now, <clears throat> where does TLC, how do we do this? I, I think it's kind of important to understand the, the equation for obtaining the FRC with plethysmography. It's actually pretty, uh, it's, it's a pretty simple process. A lot of people think it's really complicated. I think it's kind of important to understand where we get that. So I don't want to spend a lot of time in this, but I want you to understand that when we use Boyle's law, pressure times volume and then times P prime V prime, the purposes are trying to solve for V. That's the functional residual capacity. PV is the uh, atmospheric pressure at rest. When you're, when you're just sitting there in the body box, you know, with, with the valve closed or in a sealed container, you get the atmosphere pressure and the V is gonna be your FRC. And then what this P prime V prime is, okay, how we derive that right here is we say that when you start panting in and out, you're going in and out, one hertz, little tiny breaths, okay? You're taking that, what you're doing is you're creating more negative pressure inside the chest, okay? Cause you're sucking on a closed valve. 
And as you're doing that, you're expanding the volume of the chest, okay, against that negative pressure. So it's basically P, you know, the atmospheric pressure plus the change in pressure panting uh, times the volume plus the change in, in volume as you're panting. And what you simply can do is take this equation and you substitute it for this, okay? So now you have your atmospheric pressure times your FRC equals this equation. And you just simply do algebra from this point on. You solve this quadratic equation and you're left with this. And this little delta P delta V here, that number is so tiny. It's during the panting, the change in pressure and volume, such a tiny number compared to these. We can actually, we cross it out, we eliminate it. And now we're left with this, okay? And notice how these two now can cancel each other out. They make zero. So now zero is kind of equal to this, which is this. Simple algebra here, guys, okay? And then we simply move one of these guys to the other side of the equation. And then at that point, we want to solve for V, the FRC, okay? So this is what you're left with. You have atmospheric pressure. And then the question is, where do we get this delta V delta P? Well, we get that from the panting maneuver during uh, plethysmography. We're panting. These are mouth pressures, mouth pressure, uh, uh, box pressure, and it's a box pressure changes. And because, remember now, because these are, as P goes up, V goes down, they're linear relationships. One goes up, one goes down by the exact same amount. Okay, so what you could do then is instead of using box pressure, you can make this volume because they correlate directly to each other. And how you put your little tick marks of volume is you, your body box is something that's very carefully crafted and it's calibrated so that any change in pressure, you know exactly how much change in volume that's going to be in this axis. Okay, so we can make this a delta V over del, uh, delta P. That's delta P, delta V here, down here. And then we simply know, well, what's the cosine of that? Okay, or uh, cosine, cotangent. Yeah. Anyway, you simply you know, calculate your alpha adjacent over opposite, and uh, you end up with your FRC. But basically there is room for a lot of error is during that panting, how big are you panting? How short is it erratic maneuver? Uh, when do you close the valve? Did the patients start actually FRC and they start a little bit higher? There's a lot of factors in there. And the point I'm trying to make is with all these calculations of this, you know, we really can't make this the gold standard. We know TLC, TLC testing is prone to much greater error than F, the FVC. We know the FVC has good multiracial predicted equations. Volumes do not. Okay, we remember we showed dispirometry last week. We have multiple races for that. Uh, with previous authors uh, that we've been using here, kind of interesting that it's uh, the, the confidence intervals do not change with height or age with Crapo and other people before him. Uh, the problem with this, though, is in a short person, the lower limb to normal TLC, uh, okay, the confidence interval is 1.6 liters. Well, as that patient gets shorter and shorter, that 1.6 liters gets to be a much greater percentage of their predicted value. So if you're like a five foot two male, your confidence interval could actually be down like 30, 34, 34% lower than predicted uh, or at 66% of predicted value. You could be 66% of predicted and still be normal. Okay, now with GLI, we've already showed you though, there, the confidence intervals do change a small amount with age and the spline factor. Uh, but again, the confidence interval doesn't change with height either with GLI. Okay. Now, the ATS, the 2005 guidelines, the, uh, we'll see, be interesting to see what the lung volume guidelines say on this, but 2005 guidelines is all we have to go on right now. They tell us that if you have any vital capacity that's normal, a TLC measurement is not necessary. In other words, if you have a normal vital capacity, anyone, slow vital, force vital, uh, during PLETH, you don't have restriction, okay? No matter, so a lot of centers that are really busy and doing a lot of tests like we are, they actually have criteria that they use it if a complete PFT is ordered and uh, unless specified otherwise, if the vital capacity is normal, the tech does not have to proceed and perform lung volumes. They just put a note on their tech notes, not perform because uh, restriction is not present. Okay, now what's, what about the converse situation? What if the TLC is reduced with a normal vital capacity? Well, what I'm gonna show you is usually when you see that scenario, we do see it pop up every now and then. And people want it with a normal VC and a low TLC, and they're compelled to want to say, erase the interpretation on computer and say, this is restriction. Uh, the cause is usually the test quality of the TLC is highly suspect. I'm going to show you why that is in a minute. 
Okay, that's the main, the majority of the reasons you see that. Okay, when we see that situation, we're going to add a qualifying statement. We're going to say that though the total lung capacity is low, restriction is not reported because the force vital capacity is normal. Now, the ATS guidelines also recommend using RV for hyper to diagnose hyperinflation. Kind of makes sense you to think about it because the RV increased RV is the first thing to occur. Uh, in, in hyperinflation due to air trapping. The RV measurement does not require all those extra spirometry and vital capacity maneuvers. It only subtracts an extra reserve volume from the FRC. We've got good predicted values and confidence intervals for the RV and the RV TLC. But again, we only have it for Caucasians and not other races. Now, to give an idea how we can use that RV, um, the situation here, we know the triad of emphysema is obstruction, hyperinflation, and diffusing impairment. I cut off the diffusion here, take my word for it, it was low. Okay, now in this situation here, uh, where's my arrow key, there it is. Okay, notice here that the FVC and the uh, dilator FVC are, are both reduced. Okay, but the TLC is normal at 99% of predicted. So we can actually say right off the bat now that the patient probably is unrestricted. There's something else going on here by the fact that TLC is, is normal. Okay, but then we, what calls our attention, why could that be? Well, because the SVC here, notice how the SVC is the same number as the FVC. You're gonna see a fair number of these tests. You know, and quite honestly, it's gonna be very, very difficult for a patient to perform a vital capacity on one type of the test and then do it another type of test. They have the exact same number to be matching. Well, the reason you see this is because when the computer wants to calculate the total lung capacity, it wants to take the best vital capacity. So what it's going to do, so it realizes this one's too low here. It's lower than the FVC. So it's going to grab the FVC and bring it down here and use that for the calculation. Okay. Now, if you go down here, look at the RV. Wow, look at this. This is like, uh, you know, 175% of predicted here. RV TLC is super high also. So you obviously, you know, this is hyperplated air trapping. And this is probably uh, an erroneous measurement here because of the poor uh, vital capacity maneuver. And you get even more clues here too by the FRC is actually normal here in this patient here uh, on that. So it tells you the patients kind of did those initial cleft measurements probably okay, but our, our spirometry maneuvers aren't so great. Now I need to call your attention to something else too that nobody ever seems to pick up downtown, but you gotta be careful because the current software, notice how the force vital capacity here is much higher than the FVC. Well, the FEV1 to SVC ratio in our current software is not able to use this number. All future software has corrected that problem based on guidelines that the FEV1 to SVC ratio is going to take the highest vital capacity, no matter where it occurs, dilator, pre-dilator here. So you need to pay attention to your retests. For example, if you actually, whoops, get back here, you. If you actually uh, take this, vital capacity, dilator 398, which is what almost a liter higher, this is gonna take this up to well above 110% of predicted, the TLC, on, by using the best vital capacity. So keep an eye out for that. Sometimes when you see this phenomena, if you, and you see the ratio here, that, uh, make sure you know, make sure if that number's a lot higher, you take that into account. Uh, that's something you may actually have to overread the report uh, because uh, the program I wrote for interpretation can only read the values that they allow us to read for the SVC. Okay, now restriction. Well, our criteria for restriction, you only have to have, uh, you have to have all three vital capacities and TLCs have to be reduced. Okay, if one is not reduced, then you don't have restriction. You just call what you do see. So to have restriction, everything has to be uh, reduced. Okay, and we talked about the situation here. What, well, what if the TLC is low, but the FVC is normal? And then you, again, pay attention to the fact, well, look at the disproportionate difference. An FEC at 80% are predicted and a TLC that's only 63% are predicted. That tells you there's probably something wrong with the measurement here. Uh, and again, look here, SVC, it's equal to the FVC. So it's, it's pulling the number down uh, up in this area. So this makes the TLC highly suspect again. Uh, and in a situation here where the FRC is normal. So again, when the TLC is low, uh, don't call that restriction. Look at all your data because almost, mo almost all the time I can tell you, you're gonna see there's a quality control issue with the TLC. 
Now, <clears throat> how do the lower limits normal compare when you take TLC to force vital capacity? And I, I showed you, these solid tracings are what I showed you last week. This is the lower limit of normal for FVCs uh, in, in a white female, uh, 60 inches tall, uh, actually three different size females, six feet tall, five feet six, 60 inches. Uh, this is the, the lower limit of normal if we're going to portray it as a percent of predicted. How much below 100% of predicted is it? And again, as the age is up to 20 to, uh, to 100, you can see how it stays steady there for a while, the lower limit of normal. Uh, but it is age dependent because you get older, the, the, the confidence almost get wider and wider and wider. As opposed to the total lung capacity, lower limits of normal for the exact same female, okay, this is for a taller one. The lower limit of normal is around 83%. It stays that way all the way up to 100. Uh, the uh, the in-between size of female, it's right at 80%. Okay. And then the short female, it's down to about 76% of predicted. Okay. On that one. So, you know, how do you resolve this situation? Because based on TLC, these are all normal. Based on uh, FVC, they're normal down to here. Uh so if this one is restricted in this area because the FVC is considered a better standard, it's not going to call restriction if, if, if they are above the lower limit of normal, no matter where they're above the lower, lower limit of normal on this one. So the FVC tends to catch more of them out here. And I also showed you this example here last week for if you're a black female, that's where the discrepancy really starts to get kind of ugly here because as I showed you last week, their lower limit of normal for the FVC never is at 80%. It starts lower than that, and it drops even faster. So all these are the patients in here. They're going to be normal that you don't want to call abnormal because they still fall within the realm of, of the confidence limits of normal for an FVC. <clears throat> now let's move on to diffusing capacity. <clears throat> little history here again. This was actually an inventor discovered by uh, Dr. Crow. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for it in 1920. Uh, but even more interestingly, actually, this is the work of his wife, Marie, who we met when she was a medical student doing research on frog skins and things like that in his lab. Well, he ended up marrying her at that point, uh, and then he won the Nobel Prize carrying on her work. Uh, it, was, it was standardized a little bit more by uh, Old Gilvey in 1957, using tracer gases and, and breath holding to determine the alveolar volumes and concentrate of CO, concentration of CO. Uh, on this. Now, they give Marie some credit, though, uh, which is kind of interesting. They ended up having three sons, and all of them ended up being like Nobel laureates and prize winners in chemistry and physics and things. So quite the family. Um, well, what affects diffusing capacity? Well, everything causes a decline in diffusing capacity. It's a very nonspecific finding. You know, emphysema by loss of lung surface area and VQ mismatching. ILD, it's multiple mechanisms. It's from thickened alveolar membranes. It's from total destruction of areas of the lung from scarring. Uh, there's also VQ mismatching, uh, shunts due to anemia, carboxyhemoglobin from smoking lowers diffusion, decreased cardiac output does it because it decreases your blood delivery to the lungs, not as much blood and not as much carbon monoxide uptake. Uh, pulmonary hypertension, multiple me uh, uh, mechanisms, but VQ mismatching is, is one of the big ones from the obstruction of blood flow. The lower limit of normal in diffusion, now we use Miller here compared to some of the other things we'll talk about in a minute here. But I want to point out to you that just it's the same problem with every other, uh, no matter who you use, whichever volume, whether it's volume spirometry. If we look at the lower limit of normal of diffusion as a percent predicted again, you know, this is 100% of their, their predicted value. I put a dark line at the 80% line. But notice here, they really, no one ever really starts at 80%. Males are in blue, females are in pink, taller people are higher up, shorter people are the dotted lines down below. But I just want to show you how the lower limits of normal, uh, they start here and they just keep falling, diffusion. So if you're a, let's see, um, a, six, a 62 inch tall male down here, you can actually be at 60% of predict at the age of 80 and you still have a normal diffusion. And that's why we don't use percent predicteds because we use confidence intervals because percent predicteds for determined abnormality are too restrictive. Again, we have the same problem. We only have equations and confidence intervals for white population. Um, uh, GLI developed equations, but they did not use any other races at all uh, either. So we're really not in a better boat than we are with, with, with Miller. Okay, ATS ERS guidelines in 2005 uh, <clears throat> said all Asians and Blacks should be adjusted downward by 7%. Middle Easterners and Hispanics use Caucasian predicted. 
Okay, now there's a lot of studies that show that blacks and Asians have different diffuse. You should use a different set of predictors. One of the problems with GLI and, uh, and a, I'm sorry, with the diffusion guidelines that came out in the, in the ERS in 2017, uh, the most recent ones, they completely ignored the race effect. They didn't even mention it. They didn't say that it should be adjusted, that it should be compensated. They just ignored it. Uh, uh, unfortunately, most people out there are interpreting that, that there's no difference between races and they use the, uh, uh, the more recent GLIs uh, for everybody, the Caucasian values. One of the reasons we've stuck with Miller, Ford Hospital, I and mean, we talked about that a lot a couple of years ago when they first came out, is Miller collected his population uh, from Southeast Michigan. Uh, that's where he did it. So he was a U of M guy back a number of years ago, uh, studied hundreds of people in Southeast Michigan. So, I mean, you can't get a better demographic population than that. Okay, <clears throat> what are some of the things you need to consider when you perform diffusion? Uh, you want, don't want to do more than five efforts because once you get above that, your diffusion starts dropping by three and a half percent every effort because of the retention of that tracer gas carbon monoxide. Diffusion is diurnal. It varies by 2.2% from morning to afternoon. And uh, that's why it's recommended you do the, the repeat test should be done at the same time of the day. Uh, decreases with smoking, with anemia, with ethanol. Interestingly, also, with menses and young females, it can decrease, decrease by 13% from the first day to the last. And that's not a blood loss effect either. That, that's been shown it's from a hormonal effect, uh, the changes in the hormones, but no one really understands what that's doing to the vasculature to do that. Uh, the cardiac output also, as I pointed out, decreases uh, uh, diffusion. Okay, when you're performing diffusion, this becomes important. The time interval between trials should be four minutes if you're normal to allow adequate washout of the methane, the tracer gas, okay? If you have severe lung disease, you should allow 10 minutes. Now, the problem is though, if we're only allowing, allotting 15 minutes or 20 minutes to perform a diffusing capacity, okay, that sometimes doesn't allow you more than just to do two tests. You know, you spend a few minutes doing the first one, you wait 10 minutes, do another one. So quite often that period is not waited. Uh, with the technicians when they get pushed. Uh, future recommendations are going to take into account the residual alveolar gas. Uh, in other words, if whatever gas is left over, you're breathing in, the recommendations are that you should do some back calculations. You don't have to wait that 10 minutes and it'll take into account that tracer gas effect and subtract it out of that. But uh, as of now, I, I don't think any of the systems actually do that, though it is now a recommendation. I know they're working on it. Okay, now to assess the fusion, no, this is the screen, you know, you need to look at the, your tracing, you need to look at the quality work, you just can't go by a number, okay? So these are what the tracings look like, and what we do is we have multiple superimposed tracings that are examined. Now, the top tracing is going to be the, the tracings of the tracer gases of methane and CO. That little green line in the middle is going to be your mouth pressure that should always be maintained at zero. And that little blue line down here, that's your inspiratory spirometry effort, okay, measured by spirometry. Let's go through these a little more carefully right now. Let's talk about the inspiratory effort, what you should be looking for. Okay, well, this is an inspiratory effort, you know, volume time curve. And essentially the patient needs to start at residual volume. His lungs have to be completely empty. Uh, that's one of the biggest mistakes in lowering diffusion here. The biggest errors is that they don't wait long enough. It could take up to 12 seconds in COPD. Okay, the inspiratory effort should be fairly rapid to a full inspiratory vital capacity. In a normal person, it should be done in less than two and a half seconds. Uh, in severe COPD, you can allow up to four, but you got to keep in mind the calculations for diffusion assume instantaneous filling and emptying of the lung. It's got a little dotted line here. That you, you can make this dotted line any place you want. We have it downtown set at 90%. And that tells the technician and tells you if the patient achieved an IVC greater than 90%, greater than 90% of their FVC, I should say. That ratio should be greater than or equal to 90%. Okay, <clears throat> now, when they expire, you need to make sure that that line comes back to the RV level, that they completely expired. If they don't, that could be a sign of uh, there's an air leak going on. But uh, the same token, if it goes below the line here, that means that they didn't start at RV, uh, which decreases the alveolar volume and diffusion. And then the breath hold time is measured using this, this tracing also. The breath hold time is very important because the, uh, it's required. It must be 10 seconds plus or minus two seconds. Or other words, in other words, between eight and 12 seconds. Well, how you measure the breath hold time is done by the computers here. You start at point, point 0.3 into the inspiratory effort. 
Okay, so you're including 0.7, 70% of the inspiratory effort, and you measure to the middle of the gas collection time on expiration. Not the beginning, not the end, but the middle of the gas collection time. Uh, that becomes important because there's multiple techniques. This is the Mead, Mead and Jones method that is used now. The mouth pressure tracing, that's the middle one. Okay, notice this is zero pressure here. The patient at, needs to uh, inspire to a full vital capacity and a valve is gonna slap close on their mouth there. They need to make sure that they maintain zero pressure in that valve. Okay, you don't wanna be sucking or blowing on the valve, creating a valsalva maneuver because that squeezes blood out of the lungs and it decreases the diffusion. You don't want this curve to be going downward or a Mueller maneuver because you're sucking on that closed valve because that's going to decrease your intrathoracic pressure, increase blood flow to the lungs, and that increases your diffusion. It's kind of the phenomenon we see in patients with acute COP attacks or asthma. They have artificially uh, elevated diffusions because they're sucking real hard against narrow airways, making more blood rush into the lungs. And it's not at all unusual, like in a patient with COPD, uh, when you measure the diffusion for the first time during an acute attack, the diffusion might be normal. Once you get them out of that, you measure them like a few weeks later after their steroids and the diffusion now is markedly abnormal. It's a decrease now. Okay. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction here. Okay, let's talk about the tracer gas collection now. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> the tracer gases. You inhale at the mouth there a combination of methane and, and carbon monoxide. You hold your breath for 10 seconds constantly here. Okay, again, you're against that closed valve here. And then as you start to expire, Okay, you're blowing out. First, you have to let you clear your dead space. The reason the gases separate, you're starting with the same concentration of methane and CO over here, but what happens is methane is not absorbed. That's your tracer gas you use to, because we, it's not absorbed, and we'll show you why that's important. And because you're now absorbing CO, this level here, it's gonna be, it's less because you absorbed a lot of that CO. Okay, we use a tracer gas to calculate alveolar volume. We use the CO2, uh, the CO tracing to calculate the actual diffusion. Now, the sample collection, that's important also. The sample collection, normally you want to collect around 750 to, uh, to 1,000 milliliters. Okay, restriction, you're allowed to get uh, only 500 milliliters if you have severe restriction. If you collect this too early, you're, uh, you're decreasing diffusion. If you collect it too late out here, well, again, you're going to have an artificially high diffusion. Now, the reason is, kind of makes sense, that gas is spent longer in the lungs, the alveoli, before you start measuring it out here, so you're absorbing more of the CO to increase the diffusion. The sample gas collection time must be less than or equal to four seconds. That begins from the start of exhalation. We start to blow out your dead space, but unlike the breath hold time, this you measure to the end of your gas collection, not the middle, but to the end. And that span must be less than or equal to four seconds. Now, all I want to show you on this curve here, I just want to show you, this is how the machine calculates diffusion. Uh, this is the equation for it. Uh, you use the tracer gas to calculate alveolar volume. And if you look at the guidelines, they actually go through this step-by-step -step for you, which is kind of neat. Okay. But eventually you get the alveolar volume by using the tracer gases. And again, you need that tracer gas to, you need to use the tracer gas to calculate what the initial concentration of carbon monoxide is as soon as it hits the alveoli. And again, use a tracer gas to do that. So the tracer gas is very, very important. And this is where it comes into play in, in two places in the equation. Some of the common errors when you measure diffusion, okay? This here is the concentration, uh, uh, gas concentration of tracer gases here. Okay, if you see like jacket uptakes, you could have an ear leak just by the same token. If you, don't, if you see it starting to drift down, another sign of an air leak that makes the poor, poor quality test. Okay, on the spirometry part, the IVC graph in the bottom of the page here, you don't wanna see transient overshoots or undershoots, either end of the curve, beginning or end here, because that's gonna alter your numbers. Uh, you don't wanna have an inhalation too slow, because again, you're not filling your alveoli rapidly, you're gonna be decreasing your, your CO measurement uh, with a smaller lung volume. <clears throat> And then during the exhalation, we already alluded to this here, when they're exhaling, if you don't come back to RV value, it's a sign of an air leak. If you go down below too far below your starting point over here, again, uh, that's a sign that you didn't start at RV and they're blowing out more air and that's gonna lower your diffusion too. Some other common errors here. <clears throat> it's recommended by the guidelines that you measure 
your gas collection sample. Now, this is the same curve, the whole, we just cut off the, bre the, the breath hold maneuver diffusion. This is when you're starting to expire your dead space. You're blowing it out here, okay? And this is where the tracer gases separate uh, the methane and carbon dioxide. Some people use helium here. Okay, <clears throat> now, uh, so it recommends to use the volumes to measure your tracer gases of where the dead space it's ended and you're now at plateaus and now you're measuring alveolar gas. Computer usually picks this, but the technicians do have the ability to move this. And here's the exact same patient. And what happened here is the tech says, you know, I'm not real happy with this point. I think maybe a little further down. And so what they're gonna do, instead of marking it right there, they're gonna shift it down a little bit to where they think it's maybe plateauing here. Gas is still coming out. Well, the effect that has on the volume, if you're measuring the volume, is notice here, you start measuring at one and a half liters uh, volume out. And here it's a little above two. So really you're starting your measurement a half liter later. Well, that's a pretty large volume here. And again, because you're measuring, you're, you're moving this further out, that gas has stayed in the alveoli longer. So there's more CO being absorbed, uh, which is gonna artificially raise your diffusion. So it's kind of, you gotta make sure that if that is moved. You gotta make sure you know why you're moving it because it can make a big difference. And that's why it's recommended to use the volume. <clears throat> All diffusion should be graded, <clears throat> A, B, C, D, or F. <clears throat> now, just like spirometry, we found, and I don't know if they're still doing this, but I sure as hell hope they are, because we found when I did the analysis of all the satellites in downtown that we, only 70% of our diffusion efforts were meeting grade A or B criteria. Okay, 30% were not. Uh, when the guidelines say you should be achieving greater than 90% on all your tests, uh, uh, grade A on all your tests, on uh, 90% of your tests, that is. Okay. Uh, when I started instructing everyone down there and had the techs do it routinely, it took a little while. It took a few weeks and a couple months of doing that. But when you made them start grading themselves and putting that on the reports, all of a sudden now, when we looked at the data a month after that, we found out that over 90% of our diffusions were grade A. They, they were meeting the criteria. When we stopped kind of uh, promoting it with the techs, in other words, the staff were grading and whatnot, we kind of left the techs on their own at that point without frequent uh, instruction, having meetings with them, a little sessions of the kind of how to grade and whatever. We found that that effect wore off after about a year and a half. Uh, the year it started to deteriorate by 18 months later, we're back where we started. And that's why it's important, I think, to grade these for the technicians. It's kind of their own self-report card. Okay, they start doing better when they see if they're actually doing grade A, B, C, or D. Okay, now when you have a grade A, B, A through D, not only do you grade it as A through uh, F, but you need to have a qualifying statement. If the alveolar volumes were not reproducible or if there's only one acceptable effort obtained, grade F test should be tossed. Well, what is a grade A test? Well, a grade A test is you have to have an IVC to FVC greater than 90%, okay? Your alveolar volumes between tests must be plus or minus 200 milliliters or 5%, whichever is greater. Well, the cost for that is at four liters. 5% of four liters is 200 milliliters. So anything above alveolar volumes of four liters, you need to use the 5% criteria. And it's pretty easy to do that because what you do is you take the next highest alveolar, next highest alveolar volume should be greater than or equal to 0.95, the highest one. Okay, it increases about 50 milliliters for every four liters. Uh, there's little, I put little spreadsheet tables on every computer in the lab there. So if they put in the next highest volume, they can uh, just punch in what that number is. And then they hit enter and it tells them what the highest alveolar volume is acceptable there. Breath hold times, the third criteria uh, must be greater than or equal to eight seconds or greater than or less than equal to 12 seconds to be acceptable. These are the four criteria for an A test. And gas collection next needs to be less than or equal to four seconds. And as I told you, this starts at the end of the breath hold, beginning of exhalation to the end of the sample collection when you've cleared your dead space. Now, there's a couple caveats. There's a few other situations you can call your test a grade A test. If you have, your, if you have a grade A test and your next effort is greater than IBC to FBC greater than or equal to 85%, and you have an alveolar volume that's reproducible and your gas collection less than four seconds, in other words, everything else looks good, you can average them, might be less than 90%, but you can still average them, call it a grade A test with no qualifying statement. If you have at least two grade A trials, but the alveolar volumes are greater than 200 milliliters and not reproducible, 
you can average them, you still call it a grade A, but then you have to add the qualifying statements, alveolar volumes are not reproducible. If you have only one grade A maneuver, you just tried, you just have to toss the rest of them, you can still call it a grade A, but then you say only one acceptable effort obtained. Now compare this to the spirometry guidelines for grading and spirometry when it says you need at least three efforts. And those guidelines, if you only do one, F, one effort, uh, you have to call it a grade D. Where here you can still call it a grade A, but just mention one acceptable effort. Now, essentially there's a little cheat sheet in the guidelines. We're not gonna read this now, but just wanna let you know that uh, the techs all have this taped to their computers here. Essentially the top third and the bottom third I already showed you in the previous three slides everything they said. What's a grade A and what are the uh, the three qualifying statements to still call it a grade A? Okay, so let's just, this is the most helpful little cheat sheet, the center part of this table here that you need to kind of uh, pay attention to. And how this is used is essentially the difference between a grade A and a grade B test. They're both exactly the same, good breath holds, good sample collections, but the, uh, the grade B test, the IVC is greater than 80% as opposed to grade A, it's greater than 90%, okay? Grade C test, well, how that differs is by the percent of the IVC again. If it's above 80 now, it's a grade C. The breath hold time, the breath hold time still needs to be good, uh, eight to 12 seconds, but the sample collection now can be less than five, less than or equal to five seconds. A grade D and F test, notice they both have the same IVC less than 80%. Well, if the breath hold time is either a little less than eight or greater than 12 seconds, uh, it makes it automatically a grade D. 80, less than 80 makes it a grade D. Outside these parameters makes it a grade D. But what makes it a grade F is if the sample collection time is greater than five seconds. Um, that's really the only difference there. Notice how then the guidelines don't mention, well, what's considered an F as far as IVC? I mean, what if it's 40%? Well, it doesn't even mention that at all, but I think that's kind of common sense. You got to test that bad. I don't think the techs are want to keep it anyway. Okay. The only thing that's not showing on this table is when you have to add the alveolar volume reproducibly statement uh, that, alve uh, the, that the alveolar, alveolar volumes are not reproducible because that doesn't affect the grade, whether they're reproducible or not. It's still going to be the same grade. You're just saying how reproducible it is. So let's give you a quick summary. <clears throat> Five steps. How do we grade a test that should not take you more than like 10 seconds tops to grade any test at all? First of all, is the difference between diffusion less than or equal to two. Your diffusion efforts must be plus or minus two of each other, okay? Number two step, you'll quickly get the average IVC to FEC ratio when they're averaged, okay? Uh, if it's greater than 90, it's an eight test, B 85, C is greater than 80, and D is when it's less than 80. The third thing you look at really quickly, alveolar volumes. Usually you can tell just by looking at them, the efforts on the page there, if they're within 200 milliliters or not. But then by the, the other rule is, what if the alveolar volumes are greater, the best is greater than four liters? Well, what you do is the, that 5% rule, 0.95 times the highest alveolar volume. Well, let me give you an example. If you have an alveolar volume of six liters, well, then the allowable next allowable alveolar volume is 0.95 times six is 5.6 liters. So if you have a calculator handy, you just multiply 0.95 times your highest, and that's the if your volume is lower than that, well, then the volumes are not reproducible. Uh, breath hold times, then you look down. The fourth thing you look at is the breath hold time. Make sure it's between eight and 12 seconds, otherwise you're a grade D or F. The sample collection, make sure it's greater than four seconds and less than five. Oh, I'm sorry, if it's less than four seconds, if it's greater than four seconds and less than five, you're a grade C or D automatically, greater than five, you're grade F. So if you kind of just learn these five steps, you can look at any diffusion in just a few seconds and, and know. Okay. Uh, now, before we stop, we could stop here. I just want to kind of show you a couple of examples here just to point things out here. Okay, here's a test here that was called a grade A test. We know that both efforts are plus or minus two, so we're good there, 17.9, 17.4. IVCs are greater than 90%, okay? They average out to about 80 to 98 to 99%, so we're looking good there. We see the alveolar, alveolar volumes are clearly within 200 milliliters. Actually, because they're six liters almost, we're allowed to be 300 milliliters uh, between them. Breath hold times are good between you know eight and 12 seconds. Okay, we're good there. And the sample collection time we see here is actually like one second. This is where you start your exhalation. And this is where you end your collection. It's just about one second between that. So we're good there. 
So essentially, you know, the only caveat in this test is you notice here that there's possibly an air leak here because the patient did not exhale their IVC back down to residual volume. Another quickie here. Okay, the IVCs look like a grade A test here, right? We have a 90% and 94%. Okay, that they average the 92. Looks pretty good there. But unfortunately, the alveolar volumes, okay, well, the alveolar volumes are all within 10 milliliters. So that looks pretty good too. They're really close to each other. But I hope you noticed here right away that the breath hold times are greater than 12 seconds. That makes both of these automatically a grade D test. Okay, even though everything else is like grade D, this by itself makes it a grade D. Okay, once a tech sees this number to begin with, they should immediately instruct the patient, hey, listen, when I tell you to blow out, blow out. Don't hold your breath longer because it just makes, you know, th this could have been a grade A test if they actually just, just, even with one effort, if they got the patient to just start blowing out and they told them to instead of keep holding their breath. I want to show, let me show you one more example here before we stop and take some questions here. And that this was graded a grade A test here, okay? We have three IVCs, they all look good, they're above 90%. Diffusions are all plus or minus two. So they were all averaged and called it a grade A test. Is this a grade A test? Well, notice here, the first two tests are reproducible. The third one is not. Notice here uh, that though the first two tests are reproducible, the breath hold time on both of these is a grade D test right off the bat, okay? In trial three, as you already mentioned, it's not reproducible because the alveolar volumes are greater than 200 milliliters of these other ones. So what we do here, okay, either another test should have been performed because these are two grade D. This is the only one that was a grade A by itself here, okay? Uh, so either another test should have been performed or they should have reported this as a grade A test with only one acceptable effort as, as opposed to averaging all three. Now, notice right here, what's this, this is the, uh, the pressure, mouth pressure. Notice how wavy it is. Well, mouth pressure sometimes will show the changes in intrathoracic pressure. When you see this, you're actually seeing the heartbeat. Notice that nice regular rhythm. Patients, if you take that times 10 seconds, they count those, it's a heart rate of 114. Well, every now and then we've actually diagnosed patients. If you look at these tracings, you can diagnose a patient atrial fibrillation sometimes. If you see these pulses, but they're kind of erratic, a big one, then a couple little ones here, whatever. You know, I'd look at the chart real quick because if a patient's short of breath, if, if they don't have a history of atrial fibrillation to see that, you maybe ought to be picking up the phone and calling that, that ordering physician to let them know, you better get a Holter monitor this patient because they may be intermittently going into uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, if you guys really wanna learn more about the grading of these things, uh, feel free to contact me and I can give you a special session anytime you want because I've got about 15 or 20 of these that we could step through just like in a separate hour sometime. And uh, just let me know, I'd be happy to. We'll just go through these just a little bit slower step-by-step step to show you how really the grading, after you do a few of these, it comes pretty quickly though uh, to do that. And we'll stop right there and see if we have any questions here. You guys still with me? Uh, I see a chat up here. Uh, can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can, Dr. Morris. Okay, but I thought maybe I lost you halfway through the lecture. We really got screwed. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Morris, we have one question here from Dr. Casal. Okay, go ahead. Just say it out loud. <laughs> I just wanted to do algorithms going into effect. Say that a little louder. Somebody repeat. When that are the more. new algorithms going into effect? That's the question is. Which new algorithms are you referring to? We're referencing the ones that your system, the uh, current system that we have, in case we're doing so that the next iteration will of the time frame. I didn't hear that. Wait, wait, we're, um, he's just moving up to the mic. 
Okay. Uh, you were mentioning that the uh, current system that we have set up uh, doesn't use the new algorithms, but that the new one will. I was just wondering what the time frame is for that taking effect. Uh, well, that's kind of right now. We actually put in before I retired, about six months before then, we put that in the requisition uh, for that to get the approval. And uh, how Ford, Ford Hospital typically works, it takes a couple of years for things to go through. I've talked to actually Dr. Lazar about that a few times. And uh, uh, I think the purchase orders have gone through. Uh, I know that the IT department has been working for the last six months to make sure that can be incorporated into Epic. I don't know why it's taking six months because two years ago, I wrote most of that software to be able to incorporate it also. So they'd be up and running at that time. We already went ahead and did that. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but it's something you probably have to ask Dr. Lazar. I know it's in the process. I know it's very close. There's a couple of things we need to get some uh, uh, a clarification on from them though. Uh, how it does work though is once the machines come in, uh, once the, it's the hospitals to slow down here is kind of what it is, the, the purchase orders and things. But once that goes through and they deliver the equipment, it's, it's only a matter of just a few days to set it up at that point and get things up and running. Uh, 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 there's some of the software that I wrote for it that I have to, one of the issues we have right now is we have to be able to incorporate that very easily into it. And uh, there's some things I've been working on at home the last few days, but uh, we're very, very close to that point. Uh, really the, the current interpretation you see there, it's very close uh, it's still going to be very accurate. The only time you need to really kind of be concerned is that one situation where I showed you where you have a TLC uh, or an, uh, the FEV and the SVC uh, look at the dilator FVC to see how much different. Usually they're pretty close. That one example I gave you is kind of an extreme to like a liter apart. Usually that's not the case. But look at that because if there's a big discrepancy there, make sure that that FEV and the SVC ratio. Okay, let me rephrase that. My interpretation in the program now will call, will recognize uh, an FEV1 to dilator FVC being obstructed. My software will do that uh, and mark that and it will read it, even though things may be in black on the report there. What my software that, that, that's in their interpretation now will not read though is uh, looking at the, uh, actually looking at the, in other words, I will read it, but it will not show up on the report. So if you read the interpretation carefully, it will call uh, which one the SVC is using. What it will not do though, is correct the TLC for that dilator FVC. Uh, I should have written that in actually a year or two ago, but the reason I didn't to correct that for the, the limitations of the current software, the reason I didn't write that into it is because we are getting new software at that point. I didn't wanna to have to go back and rewrite all this code here that's gonna you know, do all the debugging and everything else. And but little did I know it's gonna be two years later, we'll still got the same junk going on. Uh, at that point. Um, but if this goes up much longer, I probably will be forced to actually do that, uh, to correct that. For now, just something to keep an eye You're not going to see it very often. It's pretty rare, but just keep an eye out for it. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. Thank you. You're welcome. Like I said, if you guys want to have any kind of diffusion sessions at anything like that, let me know, because I got lots of examples. We can do it like a little mini x-ray thing, but using examples instead. I'm happy to do that anytime you guys want to. That's a great idea, Dr. Morris. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Much. Okay. Bye-bye now.